The, the specific question I want to take up this morning is, who is the bride of Christ? And that is something that you hear discussed a lot. You'll hear people talk about it. And a lot of the, with, with many things that go on within Christendom, there's a lot of things that are said about the Bible that are not accurate. And what we want to do is we want to understand what the Bible has to say on the subject. So if you would, look with me at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now what Ephesians 5 verses 31 and 32 do, verse 31 is clearly talking about marriage. It's talking about a man leaving his father and mother and, and being joined unto his wife. And then verse 32 says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And so what Ephesians 5 does is it uses the husband-wife relationship as a metaphor, as a symbol for the relationship between Christ and the church. But if you notice, it doesn't use the word bride. What I would suggest to you, you can decide this for yourself, my suggestion is that it is the best practice to use words the way the Bible uses them. Uh, sometimes people take Bible words and then attribute a different meaning to them. And what I would suggest to you is just better to let Scripture define its terms and then to use those terms appropriately. So what you'll notice in Ephesians 5 is it never uses the term bride. And there's never a time where Paul describes the church of today as the bride of Christ. Instead, get with me Matthew 25. And I want to spend some time just understanding from the Scriptures how Scripture would have us to think about this issue. Now before we jump into Matthew 25, let me give you, if you will, just a, a basic overview of time. In, in Genesis 1, the Bible begins its very first verse, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now it's interesting that in Genesis 1.1, God decided to sum up creation in that fashion. He didn't say God created the universe and all living things. didn't say He created heaven and earth and humans and plants and animals. It, God chose to describe it as, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What I would suggest to you is that basic distinction, heaven and earth, is the way to understand the rest of the Bible. So as you think about God's plan for the earth, in Genesis 3, man rebels, obviously. Satan tempts Eve, Adam and Eve, eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as a result of that, they sinned, and we're in the state we find ourselves in today. Before Satan led that rebellion on earth, he first rebelled in heaven. And he got many of the angelic authorities to follow him. So as of Genesis 3, the basic problem that God the Father faced was, there's a rebellion in heaven, and there's a rebellion on earth. I would suggest to you that the rest of the Bible is about how God is going to resolve those two rebellions. The way that God is going to resolve the rebellion on earth is that he formed a specific group of people. He called out Abram, renamed him Abraham, formed from him the nation of Israel, and the nation of Israel ultimately will receive an earthly kingdom of a thousand years, but then an eternal kingdom with Jesus Christ as its head on the new earth. That solves the problem of how the earth is going to be reconciled to God. Well, what about heaven? The way that God reconciles heaven to himself is different. What God does to reconcile heaven to himself is that today 
during the dispensation of grace, what God is doing is he places believers into the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church of today. At the catching up, what people commonly call the rapture, God will take the church to heaven. He will give us spiritual bodies capable of functioning in the heavens. And the body of Christ is what God is using to replace the fallen angels that rebel. So if you have that background, what it tells you is God's ultimate plan for this universe is to bring everything under the headship of Jesus Christ. But there's two components to it. There's an earthly component that involves Israel, and then there's a heavenly component that is addressed by the body of Christ, the church of today. So now go with me to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now in Matthew 25, obviously we're reading about information that is prior to the cross. It's prior to, to the revelation given to Paul. And this parable is the parable, uh, sometimes called the parable of the ten virgins. And they're going forth to meet the bridegroom in verse 1. Notice then verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And then if you would just skip forward to verse 13. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now just for the sake of time, I didn't read all 13 verses there, but here's what's going on. In the parable of the ten virgins, the ten virgins are waiting for the bridegroom to come. When you read verse 13, it specifically tells you who the bridegroom is. Who's the bridegroom? The bridegroom is Jesus Christ. And the parable of the ten virgins is a parable about kingdom saints looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just do this if I could. If you see the chart as it is, notice what happens to this section right here. It disappeared. And, and the reason why we have two versions of the chart is that if you stand right here, if you stand in Acts 8, so right after the stoning of Stephen, and someone were to say, draw the timeline of history, this is what it would look like. And it would look like that because the dispensation of grace was a mystery hitting God, according to Ephesians 3.9, that was not revealed or known or understood prior to the time that God revealed it to the Apostle Paul. Meaning, if you stand in Acts 8, based upon reading the Old Testament, based upon everything you know about the Lord's earthly ministry, you have no idea that in the next chapter he's going to save Saul He's going to rename him the Apostle Paul, and he's going to give him the revelation of the mystery. That information just was not known. So let's, for the moment, let's hide that information, and now let's just stand right here. So if we're right before the cross, and the Lord is, during his earthly ministry, he is teaching the parables of the kingdom, and they're specifically called the parables of the kingdom. They're explaining how the kingdom is going to operate, and they are explaining how to get into the kingdom. Now, just keep this in mind. This chart is not to scale. So if you go from here to here, you're talking about almost 2,000 years, but it's just this little amount, right? But when you stand right here, so that would be the Lord Jesus Christ, and you look over to here, that whole thing there is, from the Lord's birth to right over here, is less than, it's about 40 years. Now, my point in telling you that is this. As you stand right here, right before the cross, from right before the cross over to Acts 8, you're talking about a short period of time. So folks right there would be thinking about Daniel's 70th week. If you read Acts 2, when Peter stands up by the power of the Holy Spirit, what book does he quote? This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. 
And Joel specifically talked about the last days. In other words, the way to think about the parables of the kingdom is the parables of the kingdom are instructions for the little flock, Luke 12, 32, as to what they need to do to make it through Daniel's 70th week into the kingdom. Okay? So in Matthew 25, when we see this parable with the ten virgins and they're waiting for the bridegroom, it's absolutely clear what's going on. It is instructions to the little flock as to how they're supposed to wait for the Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the bridegroom is unmistakable. Who is it? It's Jesus Christ. Get with me John chapter 3, if you would. John three twenty nine. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Well, that makes sense. But the friend of the bridegroom, today we would call that the best man is the terminology we would use. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Notice the last part of the verse. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So the person that's speaking there in John 3.29 is John the Baptist. And what John the Baptist says there is he says, the bridegroom has the bride. Well, we know who the bridegroom is because we just saw that in Matthew 25. The bridegroom is Christ. In John 3.29, John describes the friend of the bridegroom, the best man, if you will, and who's the best man according to John 3.29? It's John the Baptist. Because he says at the end of the verse, This my joy therefore is fulfilled. So what we've identified so far, the bridegroom is Christ. That's easy. Who's the bridegroom? The bridegroom is John the Baptist. Now as you think about this, was John the Baptist teaching about the dispensation of grace and the formation of the body of Christ. Well, he couldn't have been. It hadn't even been revealed. What John the Baptist was doing is he was teaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom was going to form a believing remnant out of the nation of Israel. So let's just pause there for a minute, make sure we understand what that means. When Jesus Christ shows up to Israel, Israel is in an apostate, in an unbelieving condition. Does that ring a bell? Let me put it this way. When he goes into the temple, does he say, you guys are doing a great job. I couldn't be more pleased with how you're handling everything. This is terrific. Or does he create a whip and drive people out of it because they've made his father's house a house of merchandise. In other words, when he shows up to Israel, he doesn't find them in the spiritual condition that they should be. And he spends much of his ministry rebuking them for that. Woe unto you Pharisees. Okay? So what happens is the nation as a whole is in unbelief. And what John the Baptist is, John the Baptist is the voice of one crying where? In the wilderness. He's crying in the wilderness because he is standing outside of religious Israel. In other words, John doesn't go into the temple and they embrace him and they say, yes, John, we're teaching exactly what you're teaching. What he's doing is he's protesting it. He's standing outside of it. And so what Israel does, what believing Israel does, is they go out to meet him and they're baptized of him in the wilderness. My point is what you need to understand about what's going on during the Lord's earthly ministry is he is forming this little flock, this believing remnant that stands apart from the apostate leadership of the nation. Okay? Now, Get with me, if you would, Matthew 9, verse 14. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, 
Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft? That just simply means often. But thy disciples fast not. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Well, we know who the bridegroom is. It's Jesus Christ. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. So we know the bridegroom is Christ. We know that the friend of the bridegroom is John the Baptist. What we're now learning is we're learning about some folks that are called the children of the bride chamber. Who are they? Well, it's the Lord's disciples. Isn't that clear? So in verse 14, why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? They're not fasting because the bridegroom is still with them. But what's going to happen, according to verse 15, the bridegroom is going to be taken away, and at that point they'll fast. So the, the children of the bride chamber in Matthew 9 is a reference to the disciples during the Lord's earthly ministry. Now again, just to be clear, those disciples during the Lord's earthly ministry is not the same thing as the body of Christ. It's just not. They're saved under a different gospel. They are part of a different church. And they have a different destiny. The folks that were saved under the Lord's earthly ministry, where will they end up for all eternity? They'll end up on the new earth. But those who are saved during the dispensation of grace, where will you spend eternity? You'll spend eternity in the new heaven. The reason this is so critical is one of the most basic mistakes people make today is they take Matthew to Revelation, they take those 27 books, the books of the New Testament, and they conclude those books are all about the same thing. They're all written to the same people. They're one unified body of information. And they're just not. So get with me Galatians 2, 7 if you would. We could talk about this particular issue for hours, but let me just prove the point this way. Galatians 2, 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, who's the me in that verse? Has to be Paul, the author of Galatians. So he had the gospel of the uncircumcision as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Well, it's just to state the obvious, are uncircumcision and circumcision the same thing? Well, you know that they can't be, right? What does the prefix un mean? Not. So uncircumcision is not circumcision. Circumcision is circumcision. Peter and Paul had different gospels. Now, sometimes, you know, when you say that, or when I say that, people have an allergic reaction and they think it's, it's heresy and what crazy new doctrine is this. But what does Galatians 2, 7 say? I mean, the text unmistakably says, Paul had this gospel, Peter had this gospel, and it gives them different names. They're not the same gospel. And by the way, if you actually sit down and read what Paul taught, and what Peter taught, they did not teach the exact same thing. In fact, that's why there was a conference in Jerusalem in Acts 15. So the point just to notice is this. Peter and Paul have different Gospels. They're going to different people, and those people have different destinies. So when we read about the children of the bride chamber over here under the kingdom Gospel, that's not the body of Christ. So now get with me, Revelation 21. Now as we turn to Revelation 21, let me just make this point. 
It was Matthew 25 that described Jesus Christ as the bridegroom. In other words, it was under the prophetic scriptures of the kingdom program. John the Baptist was the friend of the bridegroom. It doesn't say Paul was. There's no verse that says Paul was or that anyone in Paul's epistles was. It's John the Baptist that's the friend of the bridegroom. And the children of the bride chamber are disciples during the Lord's earthly ministry. Well, if that's all the case, would it make sense that the bride of Christ was something in here, or would it make sense that the bride of Christ pertains to the kingdom program? I mean, in other words, every piece of evidence you've seen so far suggests that whatever the bride of Christ is, it pertains to the kingdom program, not the mystery program. Now look with me at Revelation 21, verse 2. And I, John, now this is John the Apostle, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, notice, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the bride in Revelation 21, 2, is actually not a group of people. What is it? It's a city. So that's, that's weird. How do you marry a city? That just seems odd. Well, look with me at verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now the particular phrase, the bride of Christ, never appears in Scripture. It just doesn't. But the bride, the Lamb's wife, does. And is anyone confused about who that is? I mean, the Lamb is clearly Jesus Christ. And so this is the closest thing in Scripture to that phrase. And it's describing here the bride, the lamb's wife. Now, let's just read the last sentence there again. Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. In other words, in verse 9, what the angel says is, I'll show you exactly what the bride is. So look at verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. I think it's actually quite easy, right? I don't think it's actually that complicated. The, the bride, the lamb's wife, is unmistakably the new Jerusalem. Revelation 21.2 tells you that. Revelation 21.9 and 10 tell you that, Right? So that's the answer. Look with me at Isaiah 62. Now while you're turning there, let me ask you this question. Is the body of Christ, is the church of today going to end up in the New Jerusalem? You're not going to. It, I want you to get Isaiah, but I'll just quote this to you. What Ephesians 1 verse 3 says is this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's a very profound verse. And so let me just make a couple observations before we go to Isaiah. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And the reason we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places is that's where God intends for us to operate. The body of Christ was formed as a replacement for Satan and his fallen angels. They are going to be expelled from heaven in Revelation 12. You can read about that in Revelation 12. And the body of Christ is going to occupy the positions they formerly occupied. That's why God blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now, another implication of that is this. I realize there's a lot of teaching within Christendom 
that says God wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise, right? In other words, if you just send enough money to the preacher on the TV, then God will open the windows of heaven and pour out blessing on your life. And so if you're sick, it's probably because you didn't tithe enough. And there's this whole series of teaching that what God will do is you can evaluate your relationship with God by the circumstances of your physical life. And if you have a physical problem in life or financial or whatever it is, it's because of some spiritual problem in your relationship with God. But that's just nonsense. That's just total nonsense. God did not promise the body of Christ. He didn't promise believers today that you wouldn't have physical problems in life. And quite honestly, you're going to, because guess what happens if you don't live until the catching up? You're going to die, which is sort of the ultimate health crisis, right? So God is not going to solve all of your physical problems. He's just not. But death, honestly, is just a speed bump, isn't it, to the eternity that awaits you. Now, what I'm getting at is this. the whole, All of this carnal teaching about how God is going to bless the physical circumstances of your life is just nonsense because God has blessed you with all spiritual blessings, not physical blessings, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Until you get there, there can be all kinds of problems in this life. I'll just mention this, maybe it's stark, but Saddam Hussein had human shredding devices. You know what a paper shredder is? Paper shredder is you want to shred a piece of paper into so many small pieces that no one can identify what the paper originally said. Well, he essentially had the equivalent of that for his enemies. Well, was God asleep? Did God not know that was going on? You know there were saved people that experienced that. And the reason why that happened is we live on a sin-cursed earth. And there's just going to be physical problems in life. But after you've been in heaven for 10,000 years, do the physical problems in life mean much? No, they just don't. So what I resent, you know, I resent the, the, when people teach purportedly from the Scriptures God's going to solve the physical or financial or health problems of your life. Maybe, but there's no guarantee of that. There are saved people that get sick all the time and just have problems in this life. You're not promised that those things will go away. What you're promised is your eternity future is unmistakably good. You have all spiritual blessings. All the problems of life will be resolved. But between here and there, there's a lot that can go wrong. Often it does. Look with me at Isaiah 62. Isaiah chapter 62. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. So you can see the subject there is Jerusalem where it says, for Jerusalem's sake. Now look with me at verse 6. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem. You see how it's written as if he is addressing Jerusalem. He's speaking directly to the city. Then look with me at verse 12. And they shall call them. So them is third person. This is someone he's speaking about, not to. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou, this is who he's speaking to, thou shalt be called sought out, notice, a city not forsaken. So who is the Lord speaking to in Isaiah 62? He's speaking to the city. You can see that in verse 6 when he says, O Jerusalem. You can see that in verse 12 when he says, Thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. So Isaiah 62, again, is addressed to Jerusalem. Look at verse 2. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. Notice. And thou shalt be called 
by a new name. What happens when a bride gets married? She gets called by a new name, right? The thou here is addressed to Jerusalem, and the Lord is telling Jerusalem that Jerusalem is going to be called by a new name. Look with me at uh, keep, keep Isaiah 62, but get Revelation 3 for a minute. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. Notice this. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. So what's going on here is this. It's clear that the Lamb's Bride is the city of the New Jerusalem. And it's clear that Jerusalem will be called by a new name. But then what Revelation 3 is describing is it's talking about some of the people that are going to inhabit it. And what happens is what's written upon them is the name of my God, but also the name of the New Jerusalem. Now look with me at, um, see, look what the first part of verse 12 says. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar, and they shall go no more out. What happens is the individual saints are made pillars. They're, they're affixed. They're, they're, they're cemented, if you will, to the land. Were there times in the past where Israel was kicked out of the land? There were. After the New Jerusalem is set up, will they ever be kicked out of the land again? No, they, they won't be. Go back to Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62, verse 4. Thou, this is Jerusalem, shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah. Why? For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. You can see what's going on is God's marrying the land. He's not going to ever separate from it again. So forsaken becomes Hephzibah, which means my delight is in her. Desolate becomes Beulah, which means to marry. So when you think of the hymns that talk about Beulah land, it's about God marrying the land. Get with me John 2 and Matthew 23. And we're coming back to Isaiah, but get John 2 and Matthew 23. Look at John 2. John 2 verse 16. John chapter 2, verse 16. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Notice, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. What the Lord does in John 2 is he rebukes the religious leaders and, and says to them, You're taking my father's house and making it a house of merchandise. Contrast that with Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, verse 7. Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem is being addressed. Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. So he's addressing, to, he's addressing Jerusalem, 
And he's telling them, he's basically rebuking them for their, their rebellion. Now notice what he says in verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Do you remember how in John 2, he says, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. In Matthew 23, he says, your house is left unto you desolate. Here's what's going on. When the temple exists, the temple's value is the fact that God dwelled there, right? It wasn't just the value of the furnishings that were within it or the materials used in building it. It was the fact that it was God's presence. And so what the Lord says in, in John 2 is, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. In other words, you're, you're tarnishing my father's house with, with the way you behave. In Matthew 23, what he's saying to them is even worse. What he's saying is, it's your house because I'm leaving. You see the point? In John 2, it was his father's house because the father was still there. In Matthew 23 is, you want to act like this? Okay, it's yours. And I'm departing. And then what happens? The veils rent. What good is the temple if God leaves it? <laughs> Nothing. My point is, are there times on the timeline where what God does to the land is he said, that's what you want to do? Do it. Isn't there a time in the Old Testament where God gave Israel a bill of divorce? Book of Hosea, right? But what you're seeing here when it talks about the Lamb's bride is there's going to be a time in the future where God's going to marry the land and he's never going to depart from it. And that's, that's the promise. Get with me Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62, verse 5. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. The thee again is Jerusalem. As the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. It couldn't be more clear, could it? What God is saying there is he's going to marry Jerusalem, never to separate from it, and the sons of Jerusalem are going to be pillars in Jerusalem. They're never going to depart out of the land. You recall that what happens in the Old Testament it is as a result of Israel's rebellion, they're expelled and carried out of the land, right? If you think about what, what Nebuchadnezzar does, when, when the southern kingdom, when Judah is conquered, Babylon comes in, they conquer the place, and what happens is Israel is carried away captive. Right? They're carried out of the land. And it's later on that they return to it. Well, when the New Jerusalem comes down, Israel's going to be in the land and they're never, ever, ever going to leave it. That's what all these verses are talking about when they talk about the bride of Christ and they talk about the children of the bride chamber and they talk about Jerusalem's sons being made pillars. They're never, ever, ever going to leave. So here's what's going on. When people talk about the Bride of Christ and they say the church today is the Bride of Christ, there is no verse anywhere that says anything like that. I realize Ephesians 5 gives that allegory, but if you're going to use scriptural terms, the Bridegroom is Christ. The friend of the Bridegroom is John the Baptist. The Bride, the Lamb's wife, is New Jerusalem. That's just what it is. And so what happens is, in your Bible study, you always need to, to, you know, there's a great verse that's used at marriages, at weddings. What God hath joined, let not man put asunder. That's true. What God hath put asunder, let not man join. Right? If God says two things are different, is it right to try to make them the same? It's not, is it? Well, there is a difference 
between the kingdom church and the body of Christ. The body of Christ is blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. It has a heavenly inheritance and a heavenly destiny. The little flock, the kingdom church, has an earthly inheritance. They're the ones that will be in the new Jerusalem, that God will marry, that will dwell on the earth, that the sons of Jerusalem will dwell in, never to depart from. Amen? Amen.